Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. This episode will take a look at Silverjet. In the early 2000s, a small number of airlines began to sprout up in the post-9-11 world, their intention to provide affordable business class travel to the masses. They were hoping to offer a much more civilised flying experience without the hassle of huge lines at airport security and crowded terminals, but without the need for your own private jet. In 2003, Maxjet was formed, the first of these new breed of carriers. They were quickly followed in 2004 by EOS Airlines. Both of these carriers were headquartered in the United States, but focusing their main base at London Stansted Airport in the United Kingdom. Both plan to operate a growing route network across the Atlantic Ocean, with flights from Stansted to a variety of destinations in the USA, ranging from New York and Washington to Los Angeles and Las Vegas. The stories of Max Jet and EOS will come in due course, however, as we're here to look at Silverjet. Silverjet was to be a British-owned and operated airline, and while it was to compete with the already established Max Jet and EOS, it would not compete directly as Silverjet was to use London's Luton Airport rather than Stansted, which was served by the two American carriers. Silverjet would also serve Newark Airport rather than JFK and thus avoid direct competition from the two carriers when stateside. The airline had quite an experienced management team behind them. Silverjet was the brainchild of Lawrence Hunt, the definition of entrepreneur. Hunt had a string of successes in his past going back to 1984 and being involved in the six startups which were sold to companies like IBM and Telewest Communications. While his successes were in the technology sector, he had delved into the travel business too and by 2006 was a director at the Low Cost Travel Group, an online travel agency and would take up the position of Chief Executive Officer at Silverjet. Taking on the role of non-executive chairman was Peter Owen. Having spent 21 years at British Airways, he finished there in 1990 as the Director of Operations. He went on to briefly serve as the chairman of the Irish flag carrier Aer Lingus before moving into the insurance sector and taking roles with several healthcare and insurance providers. The airline's operations director had spent 10 years as head of operations at Virgin Atlantic during their boom years as well as holding the same position at MyTravel, formerly Air Tours. The finance director had spent 16 years at Thomas Cook in numerous senior roles. The customer experience director had spent 24 years at British Airways, ending his time there as the head of in-flight service, so with such a storied management team behind them, Silverjet was bound for glory. Well, you know the drill. This is grounded, so maybe not. In May 2006, Silverjet successfully raised £25.3 million from its initial public offering, putting Silverjet on course to launch its airline operation within six to nine months. Starting an airline is a costly affair, but Silverjet had managed to secure enough funding to get things started, but the directors spotted an even easier, quicker and cheaper way. The British charter airline Flyjet, established in 2002, had a fleet of three aircraft, two Boeing 757s and a single 767-200ER, which it had just acquired. The airline had also run into considerable difficulty due to endless reliability problems causing lengthy delays and lost contracts. To top it off, their recently acquired 767 was not fit to enter service and the airline looked certain to be forced into bankruptcy soon. The UK Civil Aviation Authority would in fact revoke Flyjet's licences in August. This gave Silverjet a golden opportunity. They saw Flyjet as a perfect pre-packaged airline starter kit. If they could acquire Flyjet, then they could get their operating licences and certification as well as a fleet of free aircraft. With one eye on Flyjet, Silverjet continued its preparations with the company signing a letter of intent with Thomson Fly, formerly known as Britannia, for two Boeing 767-200s. In September, Silverjet secured a $37 million financing deal which would secure the aircraft on a sale and leaseback agreement for 10 years and, crucially, cover the cost of converting them from a high-density lesser configuration to their low-density all-business class config with live flat beds. With the deal signed, Silverjet expected these two aircraft to be delivered and ready for service by March and October 2007, respectively. On October 2, 2006, Silverjet acquired Flyjet in a deal worth between four and £5.5 million, which was to be paid over three years. By acquiring Flyjet, Silverjet could now bring forward its launch date by a considerable margin. 
The company no longer needed to cut through regulatory red tape, as it could simply set up a new airline and piggyback on Flyjet certification. Crucially, the takeover also gave Silverjet its first Boeing 767. Delivered to LAN Airlines in 1986, the 767 had also seen service with Trans Brazil and Air Madagascar before it was placed into storage in January 2003. The Cameroon government acquired the aircraft next, however they only operated the aircraft for a short while before it was once again placed into storage. Flyjet took delivery of the aircraft in April 2006, however it wasn't able to enter service as the CAA refused to sign the aircraft off for passenger service. Reportedly, there were several technical documentation issues believed to be related to the aircraft's time in Africa, with the aircraft also potentially being repaired using unapproved parts. The 767 had been a total disaster for Flyjet. It had spent the majority of its time in storage with just the odd training flight taking place. However, with Silverjet now taking charge, things were looking up. Silverjet was able to throw money at the aircraft and soon enough it was able to enter service. It operated a handful of flights for Flyjet to cover its increasingly unreliable 757 fleet, but would soon be transferred over to Silverjet. In November 2006, the 767 was transferred to Silverjet and promptly sent to Maastricht for repainting into the Silverjet livery and would soon undergo a cabin refit. With Silverjet securing its first aircraft a lot earlier than planned, they were able to move their intended launch date from April 2007 to January. Things were now moving at a fair clip, Silverjet obtained the relevant licenses from the US authorities to allow it to operate scheduled flights, and finishing touches were being put in place on Silverjet's private terminal at Luton Airport. While both EOS and Maxjet offered lounge access, depending upon the airport it was either exclusive to them or shared with passengers from other airlines. Silverjet on the other hand would offer something much more superior. Silverjet established a dedicated private terminal at London Luton Airport, using part of the old terminal building exclusively for their passengers, who could check in between 2 hours or just 30 minutes before their flight and enjoy the facilities on offer. There were no check-in desks, instead passengers would leave their luggage with a concierge, and if they'd not already checked in online, then seat-side check-in would be offered within the lounge. Silverjet also had a dedicated check-in area at Newark Airport as well as their Silver Lounge which would again give the passengers a much more civilised experience. Silverjet also offered a variety of ground transport options. A chauffeur could pick passengers up at home, their hotel or their office and take them to the airport. If that wasn't grand enough then helicopter transfers from central London to Luton were also possible, though I shudder to think how pricey they were. If you had to slum it on public transport though, then Silverjet would pick you up and drop you off at Luton Airport Parkway Station. This last service was free of charge for Silverjet passengers, with exclusive taxis running a regular service between the airport and the station. On the 7th of December 2006, Silverjet's first aircraft returned from Maastricht to dawned with the new airline's livery. It was a very grey affair, arguably drab rather than classy depending upon the lighting conditions at the time. The entire aircraft was painted grey with huge Silverjet billboard titles running almost the entire length of the fuselage. These were a darker shade of grey and then under the forward cabin windows were smaller Silverjet titles painted on in silver reflective paint. The issue with the livery was simply that if it was a grey day, aside from the aircraft arguably having a level of camouflage only seen in military aircraft, the large billboard titles tended to blend into the main fuselage paint leaving the aircraft looking very dull. On a sunny day, however, it looked really good. The first aircraft had a plain grey tail with no design, but its sister ships would arrive with a silver stylized British flag painted on to brighten things up a bit. Having been delivered to Luton for some publicity shots, the aircraft was then ferried to Manchester where it would undergo some minor maintenance before entering service. My Travel Engineering had won the contract to perform the maintenance on the Silverjet fleet, and this raised a few eyebrows. While my travel was certainly more than capable, it was rather odd that Thompson Fly, who would have been the ideal choice, were not used. Thompson Fly were providing Silverjet with its next four aircraft and therefore thoroughly experienced on those littoral aircraft. Their facilities were also at Luton and thus negated the need for empty ferry flights between Luton and Manchester every time some heavy maintenance was required. 
One can only speculate, but given Silverjet's spared no expense approach to things, that perhaps Thompson Fly were too busy to take on the work, or had some other reason not to be involved. Having been re-registered as GS Jet and given the name Silver Spirit, the aircraft would perform a number of crew training flights ahead of the airline's inaugural service. Silverjet had made a point of recruiting its cabin crew from outside the industry, claiming that they would offer a higher standard of service. This was a surefire way to alienate those crew who were still working for Flyjet at this point, as well as any crew in general come to think of it. Regardless of this claim, a fair number of crew did come from other airlines despite the gimmick. On the 25th of January 2007, Silverjet officially took to the skies with their inaugural flight departing from London Luton bound for New York's Newark Airport. This made Silverjet the fourth business class airline operating between Europe and North America after EOS, Maxjet and Lavion, the latter having begun operations between Paris and Newark just weeks earlier. Silverjet, Maxjet and EOS all had a varying level of product. Maxjet arguably had more of a glorified premium economy feel to it, with EOS having a more conventional business class product with seat pods converting into life lap beds. Silverjet, on the other hand, seemed to be a strange hybrid. The seats were arranged in pairs, almost like a premium economy set up today, however they could recline into a 6 foot 3 inch bed, with the seat back forming a shell which would offer some level of privacy. The 767-200ERs used by Maxjet had between 92 and 102 seats depending on the exact aircraft. EOS, on the other hand, had just 48 seats in their 757-200s. Silverjet's 767-200ER had 100 seats in a 222 configuration, a far cry from its time with Britannia, with 290 economy seats all crammed in there. It was the level of service which set Silverjet apart from its competition. Aside from the private Silverjet terminal and chauffeur options, oh, and helicopter transport option too, if a passenger was travelling solo, Silverjet would try and keep the adjacent seats unoccupied where possible. Obviously this was easy to do with a low load factor, but once those began to climb it would become much harder to achieve. Passengers were to be treated to a very civilised experience on board. The ratio between cabin crew and passengers was 1 to 10, ensuring that each passenger got properly looked after. Everything was hand-run with no trolleys being used in the cabin, nothing but the finest foods were available and these were complemented with champagne or a wide selection of wines or beers. Interestingly, if on a night flight one didn't fancy waking up and having breakfast before landing, it was possible to have it to go and take a fresh cup of coffee too. Speaking of night flights, Silverjet had removed call bells having deemed them irritating, though in reality they still had them, they just didn't chime in the cabin. PAs and cabin lighting were also to be kept to a minimum on night flights. Frankly, this is normal procedure for almost every airline, but Silverjet included it in their marketing guff as though it was a brand new idea. Silverjet, however, were the first airline to introduce a dedicated lavatory for use by women. Speaking as someone with years of experience as crew, aircraft toilets are disgusting. That isn't water on the floor. So I think this was a great idea, and of course with only 100 passengers, it's a lot easier to dedicate one toilet just for the gals. Silverjet even advertised this fact as seen in this very civilised advertisement. One other innovation saw Silverjet become the world's first carbon neutral airline. A mandatory carbon offset contribution was included in the price of a ticket, and passengers were able to choose from a list of environmental projects for this to be spent on. A few months later, in October, the scheme was altered so that passengers had a choice of paying the fee after the UK government hiked its air passenger duty. For its effort, Silverjet was awarded Environmentally Aware Airline 2007 by the Institute of Transport Management. March saw Silverjet offer cargo services on its flights. This was a good use of resources, as with just 100 passengers on board, those 767 holds would be fairly empty, so being able to bring in some extra revenue would really boost the airline's prospects. April saw the cargo contract put to good use, with the Kaiser Chiefs travelling on board, along with 800 kilograms of equipment for a same-day appearance with Conan O'Brien. By now, Silverjet's daily Newark flight had settled down and the load factor was a reported 48%. As the airline was still in its infancy, this was somewhat acceptable, however it would need to improve if Silverjet were going to last. There was a good reason for this concern. While Silverjet was a very high-end airline, their fares were considerably lower than anything remotely comparable. 
Silverjet offered a return ticket from London Luton to Newark for £999 return, that's £1,600 in 2024 money, when a first-class ticket on British Airways easily cost at least three times that. Heck, a quick check on an LHR to JFK flight is showing fares at £10,000 one way. With just 100 seats working out at £499 each, a load factor of 48% wasn't going to cut it in the long run. Silverjet had expansion plans. The management knew that a single daily flight wasn't going to work, as of course, there was absolutely zero economy of scale. The airline was already marketing a second daily flight to Newark, and had shortlisted 30 possible new destinations as they looked at growing their route network. In late April, Silverjet took delivery of its second Boeing 767. This was a former Britannia bird, having been delivered in 1990, and aside from a spell on sublease to Tarka, it had stayed with the company throughout its rebranding to Thomson Fly, and was one of the final few remaining 200s still with the company by this point. Britannia had been the first European airline to operate the 767 back in the 1980s, and had built up a large fleet of both the 200 and larger 300 series model. By the early 2000s, however, most of the smaller 200s had been disposed of, and by 2007 the airline had just four remaining. Two of these were in the process of transferring to Silverjet, while the other two were earmarked to follow their sisters soon enough. This aircraft arrived two months later than scheduled, however, leading Silverjet to delay the introduction of the second daily Newark flight. Silverjet claimed that the delay was due to them bringing forward a sea check on their other aircraft, adding that July was traditionally the quietest month for transatlantic business travel. June 2007 saw Silverjet announce that it had signed a letter of intent with Thomson Fly for its two remaining 767-200ER aircraft, with delivery scheduled for the spring of 2008. This meant that Silverjet had a fleet of five aircraft, either in service already or under contract to acquire, which meant that the airline was already halfway to its intended fleet of ten aircraft within three years. Having postponed the introduction of their second Newark service to the end of July, it was again pushed back to the end of September, with the airline claiming that the sea check on one of its aircraft had resulted in more maintenance work than planned. This aircraft was of course the X-Flyjet 1, which had been a total basket case, so it was not necessarily a surprise to most. On the 10th of August, Silverjet announced that they would be closing their Flyjet Charter Division, with an orderly wind-down taking place before the summer season ended on October the 31st. The board stated several factors which had led to the decision, and while most folks were sceptical, there was no denying that Flyjet's increasing delays and deteriorating public image were becoming a drain on Silverjet. Just one month later, another Flyjet issue rose up and stung Silverjet square in the arse. Though arguably, Silverjet were at fault this time. Prior to Silverjet acquiring Flyjet, the charter carrier had agreed with a US-based company, Fly First Class, to operate a 767 from London to Wilmington, North Carolina, via Bermuda. This aircraft would be in an all-business class configuration, and I'm sure you can see where this is going. When Silverjet acquired Flyjet, they also inherited the contract between Flyjet and Fly First Class. However, having commandeered the 767 for their own flying program, they then needed to find a way to either honour the contract or to back out. At first, Silverjet offered to provide an alternative 767, as well as pay a $1 million termination fee and also refund the $750,000 deposit that had been paid to Flyjet. This seemed to placate FFC, but several months later they had received nothing that was promised and ended up filing a multi-million dollar lawsuit against Silverjet. There was also some good news for Silverjet. The sea check and maintenance on their flagship aircraft was complete, and the aircraft would soon return to service, allowing the second daily crossing to begin from September the 23rd. The airline also took delivery of its third aircraft, an identical twin to its slightly older sister, this aircraft was delivered to Britannia just one day after its sister ship, and in a way it was rather fitting that both aircraft led almost entirely identical lives both before and after their time with Silverjet. On October 4th, 2007, Flyjet operated its final flight using its own aircraft. The airline would instead charter aircraft from other operators to operate its final flights, as the airline would wind down by the end of the month. With Flyjet ceasing its charts program, all of the attention could now focus on Silverjet and maintaining its steady growth. With the fleet now standing at three aircraft, Silverjet announced its newest route. 
Luton to Dubai. While this was a little unexpected, with most believing another transatlantic route was imminent, Silverjet CEO Lawrence Hunt explained that Dubai has attracted large levels of investment and development over the recent years to become a globally acclaimed destination for both business and leisure travellers alike. With premium air traffic to the Emirate growing at 20% year on year, this new route represents an exciting opportunity for Silverjet. As part of the new route, Silverjet was the first commercial airline in the world to use the new 5,000 square foot executive terminal at Dubai International Airport. This also made Silverjet the first business class only airline to launch a non-transatlantic service and the first commercial carrier in the world to offer a private terminal experience at both ends of a route. Well, on the Dubai route as Newark with its private lounge and check-in area still technically shared a terminal. The Dubai flight was timed to arrive at Luton in the early afternoon and provide an onward connection to the late afternoon Newark flight now that that was online as well. With this new route set to launch on November the 18th, Silverjet took the opportunity to attend the Dubai Air Show in early November to showcase its product and drum up additional business. With the Dubai route taking off, Silverjet introduced another innovation, becoming the first airline to offer the services of a retail therapist. Lucia van der Post, luxury guru, whatever that is, columnist and author of Things I Wish My Mother Had Told Me, would call upon decades of retail experience in solving the nation's shopping dilemmas to provide a tailor-made retail prescription for all Silverjet customers. She would use her expert knowledge to find perfect Christmas presents, the best January sales bargains, offer guidance on sizing the ins and outs of tax declaration, and knowing whether or not something is a good deal. Cutting through the marketing guff, passengers could email their flight info to Lucia, who would then use their likes, dislikes, budget and interests to create a bespoke shopping itinerary. This was a free service offered to Silverjet, and while it might not have appealed to everyone, it did have one big benefit. Anyone using this service was able to bring along a third checked bag. Regardless of thoughts on such a service, it was indeed another little innovation that Silverjet had offered in an effort to keep itself above the competition. Speaking of competition, on December 24, 2007, Maxjet suddenly ceased operations. The company had been struggling in its final few months, with its shares being suspended and its board undertaking last-ditch rescue talks. The company had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, but knowing that it couldn't meaningfully restructure, it suspended operations on the same day, Christmas Eve. Talk about bad timing. The collapse of Maxjet was a warning to competing carriers. Despite having a good product, a fair-sized fleet and a growing route network, it was still very difficult to succeed. Maxjet had five Boeing 767s when they collapsed. Two of these had compatible engines with the Silverjet fleet, however Silverjet were unable to pick these up and speed up their own growth as they themselves were not exactly flush with cash. Just days earlier, an extraordinary general meeting was held to approve a £22 million fundraiser, of which £12 million came from existing shareholders and a further £10 million in the form of a convertible loan. This was just months after an aborted attempt at raising £26 million. Despite this, Silverjet insisted that they were in good shape and set to make a profit in their first year of operations. Silverjet had a very turbulent January, starting off with a spat between Silverjet CEO Lawrence Hunt and the Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone. Back in May, the Mayor travelled on a Silverjet flight to Newark for a climate change conference, yes, I know the irony is delicious, and had a less than stellar experience. Upon landing in Newark, he told the Evening Standard that it was the worst flight of his life. Remarkably, a furious Lawrence Hunt managed to track Livingston down at his hotel and demand that he explain to the press that the issues were not Silverjet's fault these being an ATC failure, meaning that the flight was two hours late, and some turbulence near New York. Ken refused to do so, and thus the spat drew on. It took nine months before Livingston admitted that he was talking about the severe turbulence, by which point things had gotten so heated that Lawrence Hunt had effectively banned Ken Livingston from flying with Silverjet, being quoted in the press as saying, I can't stop him booking with me, but if I find he's on one of our flights, I'm going to cancel it. Hilariously, the same day that Lawrence Hunt gave that statement, he came out to find that his car had been clamped outside an office in the capital. 
it cost him £130 to get it removed, took them 45 minutes to come and do it, and later admitted that it was their mistake, with Hunt joking that, I think Kenny's after me. It wasn't just the Mayor of London that had rubbed the Silver Jets CEO up the wrong way either. Mike Stoddart, an analyst with stockbroker Daniel Stewart, claimed that Silverjet shares were worthless, and as a result, Silverjet shares plummeted 28% in a single day. The shares recovered slightly after Silverjet responded that Stoddart's statements had numerous material mistakes. I'm just going to quote directly here as, well, I love this. Mr Hunt said, This guy is a complete muppet, and his note is full of schoolboy errors. He also added that Mr Stoddart was also unwelcome on Silverjet flight, saying that there is an exclusion zone around Luton for him. Very mature, but I like it. January also saw British Airways announce its intention to operate a competing service. Using two specially refitted Airbus A318s, BA would operate a twice-daily service to New York JFK from London City Airport, right at the heart of the capital. BA obviously needing to find a replacement premier service after their retirement of Concorde a few years earlier. On the subject of British Airways, back in 1989 they released what I consider the greatest airline television commercial in history with the face advert. Made by Saatchi and Saatchi and directed by Hugh Hudson, this iconic advert saw thousands of people gather on a salt flat. People from all walks of life, from all cultures around the world unite with a British Union Jack in the background and British Airways crew members in the midst of it before cutting to an aerial view of the face, which then smiles and winks before turning into a globe, accompanied by the iconic British Airways Landor design Speedwing logo and the roar of Concord. Real eye-watering stuff for this guy who likes to live in the past, but I am actually going somewhere with this. Silverjet managed to recruit MNC Saatchi to make their own adverts. Given that the latter were a bit sour after being unceremoniously dropped by British Airways a few years earlier, they were more than happy to have a dig. And dig they did. Silverjet's very civilised advert was not quite a shot-for-shot remake of the British Airways face advert, but close enough. Instead of swathes of folks making up the face, there were just four people. This was to highlight that Silverjet was exclusive and not for the masses. This was all accompanied by BA's signature tune, the flower duet, performed a cappella, compared to the more upbeat Yanni version. This advert ran from the launch of the airline, and along with the one advertising the benefits of the ladies only loo, were the only two television adverts used by Silverjet during their existence. Both played on the word civilised, which was intentionally spelt civilised with an S, which aside from giving my spell checker a workout, has also had an effect on some folks who would read it as silver, myself included. The first few months of the year are always the quietest for the industry. In January, Silverjet's load factor was a meagre 58%. This was up from a dismal 52.8% in December. January also saw Silverjet celebrate its first year of operations, with the airline launching its first ever sale. This saw passengers saving 20% on tickets, with round-trip fares coming in at just £879. This was obviously an attempt at doing something about its shockingly bad load factors, and it seemed to have some effect, as they had risen to 65% by March. On the 27th of April 2008, EOS Airlines collapsed into bankruptcy. The airline had set to become Silverjet's biggest rival, with several proposed competing routes from London Stansted, including Newark and Dubai. EOS had a fleet of six Boeing 757s which were in a 48-seat all-business class configuration. With EOS ceasing operations just a few months after MaxJet, it did suggest that the business class only market was struggling. Once again, Silverjet offered to support passengers of the failed airline, as they had done previously with Maxjet. When announcing this, Lawrence Hunt remained defiant that Silverjet would weather the storm, due to the unique proposition and very reasonable prices, passengers can look forward to continuing to fly with Silverjet and enjoying the calm and intimate experience that we offer. Behind the scenes though, things were not looking so great. The £10 million convertible loan agreed a few months prior still stood, however the bank announced that it was not converting it into shares, opting to keep it as a loan rather than making it an investment. Silverjet was also due to take delivery of its next two aircraft that month, but was unable to finance the £25 million for the sale and leaseback deal. 
Both of these aircraft remained with Thompson Fly for a few more months before being sent to Arizona where they were both scrapped. With Silverjet unable to finance its next two aircraft, the airline was unable to grow and this put it in a very vulnerable position. The airline's board was scurrying around in an effort to find anyone willing to invest in the airline and keep the Silverjet dream alive. On 30th of April, Silverjet issued a press release announcing an update on the airline's financial position and that it had reached a memorandum of understanding with a UAE-based investor, later revealed as Viceroy Holdings. The airline announced that the investment from Viceroy would come in two tranches. First, they would provide £12.7 million through a debt and equity. £4.1 million of this would be in equity, giving Viceroy a 28% stake in Silverjet, with the remaining debt facility being available to Silverjet immediately. The second tranche would see Viceroy invest up to £38.1 million to allow Silverjet to expand, developing its brand across the Middle East, the Far East and Africa. These talks had been going on since early April and it was expected that the board and relevant authorities would approve it by mid-May. Viceroy also offered to provide emergency funding to keep Silverjet afloat until the deal could be concluded through an $8.4 million credit facility. However, when Silverjet requested $5 million to address its immediate cash flow constraints, there was nothing but tumbleweed from Viceroy. Viceroy, which according to its website was a unique luxury brand development fund that had been investing in the US since 1997 and globally since 2005, was unable to provide any funding to Silverjet. In fact, the company refused to speak to the airline's management, leading to the deal collapsing. Silverjet urgently needed that funding to address its immediate financial concerns. With that not coming through, the airline was on the verge of insolvency. On the 23rd of May, trading of the airline's shares was suspended. Things were looking exceptionally bleak for Silverjet. Even the airline's chairman, Peter Rowan, found himself declaring bankruptcy just days later, owing the airline a reported £240,000. Owen was also forced to step down from his position at the Excel Leisure Group at the same time, not that it would save them. On the 30th of May 2008, having failed to secure any funding from its supposed saviour, Silverjet was forced to cease operations the same day, with the final flight being SLR 254 from to Luton. Despite ceasing operations, there was a glimmer of hope when days later, King Place, a company registered in Ireland but managed by a Geneva-based investment fund, announced on the 10th of June that it had agreed to buy Silverjet on behalf of an unnamed client. They expected to resume operations within a matter of weeks once the deal was completed, pending approval from the airline's administrators and the authorities. It was not to be, though. Just days later, on June the 13th, the deal collapsed, primarily because the UK Civil Aviation Authority were unconvinced that the £50 million in funding required to get Silverjet both airborne and keep it there were forthcoming. With the rescue hopes in tatters, the company began liquidation proceedings and Silverjet was grounded, permanently. So, what went wrong? There were several factors which led to the downfall of Silverjet. Now, I know this video is going on far too long, so I will try to be brief. Silverjet had an excellent idea. It really did, however, it was grossly undercapitalized from the beginning. While Silverjet was able to take advantage of a critically ill flyjet and use them to speed up their own launch, they really needed to have much bigger financial reserves in order to see them through their initial growth phase. Silverjet had set an objective of 10 aircraft within the first 2-3 to three years, ambitious but doable, if they had the money. Silverjet believed that once they had a fleet of 5 aircraft, they could make a steady profit which would allow further expansion. Their figures suggested that if they had 5 aircraft, operating at a 75% load factor, then they would make £12 million in pre-tax profits. Unfortunately, Silverjet struggled to achieve those load factors on the free aircraft that it had. As I said earlier on, these aircraft had 100 to 102 seats, with fares averaging £999. If an aircraft was full, then the flight would make a profit, even more once they started hauling cargo too. However, the airline's load factors were shockingly low, doubly so considering the number of seats available. This made most of the flying a huge drain on the airline's finances. It was of course hoped that as they expanded and offered connecting traffic that it would boost their numbers. 
I think that Silverjet was somewhat misguided. Their initial press releases lambasted economy travellers and the regular airline whose business class tickets must be so expensive in order to subsidise the economy traveller. Silverjet had an excellent product and the price was so affordable that it's a surprise that they struggled to fill every flight. Even by today's standards, their ticket price works out at just £1,600 return, which is far cheaper than a premium economy seat, never mind a BA one-way first-class ticket that costs £10,000. This leads to my next point, the economy. By 2008, the global economy had begun to slow and then crumble. A result of this was less people were being able to afford to travel, and those that could may not necessarily be able to splash out on such a luxury of a silver jet ticket even if they were pretty cheap. A result of the economy taking a tumble was the change in exchange rate between the British pound sterling and the US dollar, which was down by a quarter by the end of the year. Aviation primarily uses the dollar from fuel to lease fees, and with the pound losing a quarter of its value, it left airlines facing higher bills. Then there was the fuel prices. Back when Silverjet started flying, oil was trading at around $55 a barrel, by the time they collapsed, it had nearly tripled to $132 a barrel. As the economy slumped, banks were less willing to lend money to airlines, doubly so as the number of airline casualties began to rise and rise, and this was only going to get worse. At least 11 other airlines ceased operations because of bankruptcy in 2008, with a number of those being larger carriers like Aloha, ATA, Zoom and Excel Airways. Maxjet, EOS and Silverjet all collapsed within months of each other and pretty much for the same reasons. All were niche carriers, none had a vast route network which could subsidise any underperforming routes and all three were undercapitalised from the get-go. Silverjet in particular stood out with a superior product and tried to make business class travel affordable to a greater number of people and it's a crying shame that they're no longer here because I'd sure fly with them. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments, suggestions or criticisms, please do get in touch. If you can't comment below, don't worry, I've got a contact form on my website and I'm also on Facebook, Twitter and Reddit. I have plenty more episodes in the works, so if you haven't already, why not subscribe to catch them as they land. And as always, thanks for watching.